Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we have a double interview talking with astronomer Alan Jackson and astrophysicist Stephen Desch. We will talk about their new study of Aumuamua, an interstellar body which visited our solar system in 2017. But first, we look at some odd geology on the Red Planet as researchers learn how spiders on Mars form. We also see new images of the supermassive black hole at the core of the galaxy M87. Finally, we dive into the mammoth oceans of Saturn's moon Enceladus, learning how watery currents flow under its icy shell. One of the oddest mysteries of Mars may now be solved. Aranaforms, popularly known as spiders from Mars, are geological structures resembling arachnids. These structures, seen at the south pole of Mars, can stretch up to 100 meters or about 330 feet from side to side. Researchers at Open University found patterns similar to arenaforms are produced in a laboratory when frozen carbon dioxide meets a warm bed of glass spheres. This process is similar to how the Martian Rust is heated during springtime on Mars, potentially explaining this odd phenomenon. A new image of the supermassive black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy shows this object in unprecedented detail. Researchers examining data from a pair of radio telescope networks found that highly energetic magnetic fields power jets stretching 5,000 light years across space. These same conditions also polarize light similar to sunlight passing through polarized sunglasses. This new study could help us better understand how black holes form and develop at the centers of every galaxy, including our own. A little closer to home, our solar system contains a handful of water worlds, including the sixth largest moon of Saturn, Enceladus. This world, about as wide across as the state of Arizona, is home to a vast ocean covered in an icy shell. A new study partially based on the shape of this shell shows strong ocean currents could arise circulating water and minerals around this Saturnian moon. Enceladus is one of the most likely places where we might one day find alien life among our own family of planets. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with astronomer Alan Jackson and astrophysicist Stephen Desch of Arizona State University about their work uncovering the secrets of Aumuamua.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we have a special double interview with uh, Dr. Alan Jackson and Dr. Stephen Desch of the University of Arizona State University. And they are each astronomers who have made some recent fascinating discoveries about this strange object, Al Muamua. Welcome to the show, Alan and Steve. Thanks. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. So I'm uh, going to probably start with you, Alan. Uh, now, this object was seen in 2017, which, if I'm doing the math correctly, was 511 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel like it sometimes, doesn't it? It really does. So can you bring us back a little bit and remind people what was Aumuamua? How did we find it? What do we know about uh, it? Yeah, so Aumuamua was discovered by the PanStars telescope, uh, which is based in Hawaii, hence the name. It's, it's a native Hawaiian name. Um, and it, we almost missed it, actually, in that it, we didn't actually see it, and it wasn't spotted until a couple of days after it had gone past its closest approach to Earth. Um, because it is a very faint object and was very hard to see. Um, it was kind of right at the limits of what PanStars could see. Um, yeah, so it was discovered back in 2017. Um, and now I've completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um... What, what, what were the first observations like? How did you, you know, you know, obviously there are a lot of big pieces of rock out there in the form of asteroids. And so, so what was it that first caught the attention of astronomers? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, I suppose, well, the first thing that caught people's attention was once they'd taken a few more observations, it was, and they were able to fit an orbit they realized that it had an eccentricity that was, the orbit had an eccentricity that was greater than one. And that meant that it must have been coming from outside of our solar system. And that then obviously got people's attention a lot because, well, that would, was the first time we had seen something that had come from outside our solar system. People had been expecting for a while that we might eventually see one because we know that comets get thrown out of our own solar system. But that was the first time that we had been able to confirm something, say, yep, that definitely came from outside the solar system. So that, you know, kind of immediately got people's attention uh, in that respect. And so then we took more observations of it, expecting it to look like a comet, and found that it didn't. <laughs> and that, you know, comets have tails. Oumuamua didn't, that we could see, have a tail. So then people will think, well, okay, if it doesn't have a tail, maybe it's more like an asteroid. Um, and that was kind of the idea that we were going with for a little while. But then as we had more observations with it over the course of the rest of 2017, and continued to plot the orbits that it was um, taking through the solar system, we found that that path it was taking through the solar system didn't quite match what you would expect if it were just purely going under gravity. And that's something you see often for comets because the gases that are flowing off them give them a small push, um, which would have made sense if we thought it was a comet, except right. that we thought it was an asteroid now. All right, and actually that's, that's I'd like to stand, stand to get in on this and can you tell us, you know, uh, Alan had mentioned that this object was not acting quite as would be expected. Uh, what was weird about it and what do we know yeah. about that? Yeah, you know, we, we were looking for comets. Uh, they were long conjectured to exist, but it was a bit of a surprise to see one in the first five years that Penstars was operating. And, uh, and yet it didn't look like a comet because we didn't see a tail. And yet it was pushing away from the sun. Um, the variation in the acceleration that it was experiencing, the, this extra acceleration uh, besides gravity, 
uh, tended to drop off with distance as one of our R-square from the sun, uh, the same way sunlight decreases in intensity. So it was very clear that something to do with sunlight was operating on this object. And again, that would be completely consistent with the comet. Uh, it was simply that the push was just too strong, you know, by about an order of magnitude uh, above what most comets get when water ice would sublimate on their surfaces. And uh, and because it seemed so far off, uh, it led to some conjectures that instead of the sunlight uh, evaporating gases, um, it was conjectured by, uh, by uh, Avi Loeb at, at Harvard that what instead was happening is that sunlight was bouncing off of a uh, to mylar or something, a, a solar sail. And uh, that's that's a fine hypothesis, although it um, is very quickly invalidated because the, the sail itself could not be uh, oriented towards the sun the whole time because we saw that the brightness of the sunlight reflecting off of this object was getting large and small over a few hours period. So it, it wasn't always uh, facing the sun. So there were, there were problems or inconsistencies with that. But it was just this leap to say that, you know, there was no way it could be gases like a comet, and it had to be this solar sail, which would have made it alien technology. It was just such a leap when we hadn't even really thought about all the gases or all the types of things this thing could be. Right, right. So what do you, what do you think that, what, what did this study tend to show that it probably was it's causing that? Yeah, we, we went through the list of ices and uh, we found uh, that certain gases could give it enough push. One had already been suggested. One suggested here hydrogen ice. You could take the hydrogen gas, which is plentiful in the interstellar medium, and, and freeze it into a chunk that's uh, hundreds of meters in size. Then, sure, it would boil off rapidly and give it a strong push. Uh, the problem with that one is we don't see hydrogen ice anywhere, and that's because it takes temperatures barely above uh, absolute zero to freeze. And in fact, it's very difficult to understand how you, at the cold temperatures you need, you could even get enough hydrogen atoms together to, into a chunk of anything. So uh, one ice though stood out and that was nitrogen ice, and that would give it the push and it would also um, be very plausible because we see it, we see it on the surface of Pluto and Alan can tell you more about the, the yeah. albedo. Oh, Alan, tell us more about the albedo. <laughs> what, 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 you know, what, you know, uh, you know, Steve was talking about, you know, how, you know, we've seen objects, especially like Pluto, that may be similar to what this may have broken off of. But what can we tell about its formation and composition? Yeah, so I mean, when we were looking through these different ices, seeing you know, how much um, acceleration they would give uh, to the object as they were sublimating off, you know, one of the important things is how reflective it is, what its albedo is. Because all we know about it is its brightness. And so how you convert that into a size is you need to know how reflective it is. And then also, you know, if it's more reflective, it's absorbing less sunlight. So you have kind of these two things playing off against one another. And what we found is that the albedo that you need, if it's nitrogen ice, to reproduce the acceleration is exactly the same as the albedo of the surface of Pluto, which has a lot of nitrogen ice on it. Hmm. So that kind of made a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, so then we were working with the idea that, okay, well, it, if it's made of nitrogen ice, it has the same albedo as the surface of Pluto. Pluto has a lot of nitrogen ice on it. Then the obvious um, extension to that is, well, perhaps it was knocked off the surface of something like Pluto. So you think it is a combination of, let's say, a rocky base covered in nitrogen ice or a mixture of the two or just pure nitrogen ice? We'd say it's probably mostly pure nitrogen ice. Hmm, that's fascinating. Um, and um, what I'm going to go back to Steve for this, but how would you? How do you determine how this object may have broken off of another, off of a parent body, and traveled toward our solar system? 
Right. That was one of the initial objections that some scientists had to this idea that um, that it could be nitrogenized, because even though we see uh, Pluto is, is lousy with nitrogen ice, it is just uh, the one planet that is definitively uh, known to have uh, such a large amount of pure nitrogen ice. So they thought it was unlikely that another solar system would have these um, nitrogen ice uh, crusts over these uh, worlds like Pluto in their own systems and that they would be knocked off at the frequencies you need. So it's hard to say what's going on in other solar systems, but we can look at our own solar system and ask what was the history of our solar system. And uh, there have been a number of profound discoveries in the last uh, two decades about the Kuiper Belt and the objects that live in it and what their history has been. And one of the most profound things is that uh, the planets in our solar system, the giant planets from Jupiter to Neptune, they probably formed in a more compact configuration, uh, much closer together and closer to the sun than they are now and, and moved around. And uh, as they did that, they would have destabilized this entire Kuiper Belt. We think this Kuiper Belt used to have uh, 35 Earth masses of objects in it, and today it's less than a tenth of an Earth mass. So it's been depleted by huge factors. But working backwards, other scientists have figured out that there must have been at least 2,000 Plutos and thousands of smaller bodies like Pluto. And when this, uh, system destabilized, there would have been plenty of opportunities for comets and other things to crash into the surfaces of these thousands of Plutos. And so going through the math, we calculated that the, the number of uh, fragments of nitrogen ice that you would get off of the thousands of Plutos in our solar system was a pretty good match to the number you need to explain how it was we saw one of these objects within the first five years of PanStar's operation. So uh, we don't know, again, what's going on in other solar systems, but if they're doing anything like what our solar system did, if it's somewhat universal, then it's actually quite explained. Wow, so I'll let either of you lend your expertise to this question, but so that brings to mind, how common are these objects? Are they flying all over the place, waiting to pass by us or at any time or? Yeah, that's a great question. And we know that uh, basically we in the five years of PanStar's operation, we saw one of these objects and that doesn't, it's a one-off event. So we don't know exactly how many of these objects there must be. It could be that we should get 10 a year and we were very unlucky to only see one in that time frame, Or maybe you have to wait 20 years to see one. And uh, we just got lucky to see one so quickly. But um, at, at the low end of that range is what we predict for the, the numbers of objects like this. And there should also be um, some water ice fragments like this as well. And there should also be a much smaller number of comets, but those are easier to observe. So it's notable that the year after Oumuamua came through, a second uh, interstellar object, the comet Borisov, was discovered. And uh, this was this was much more in line with expectations and it, it, it looks exactly like a regular comet, much larger. These should be very infrequent visitors, but they are easy to see once they come into our solar system. And so we tried to balance all this in the statistics. And the best we can say is that, you know, the, we saw one of uh, these fragments, one of these comets in the time frame we're talking about, that's about right. Going forward, we should see uh, about as many uh, through observations like at the uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which will scan the whole sky every night. We expect to see, uh, I don't know, at, at least one of these every year, hopefully. That's great. And of course, that leads right into a uh, question to Alan, which is, can you talk a little bit about the future instruments that are coming online in the next few years, including Vera Rubin? Uh, that can help us discover more of these Aumuamua-like objects? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is currently under construction in Chile, well, I assume they're probably nearly finished. They were supposed to be starting to take um, their first observations at the end of this year. I'm not completely sure how much they've been disrupted by COVID. Um, so, you know, it's probably going to be pushed back into the start of next year, I think. 
but yeah, so the Vera Rubin Observatory is kind of really the the one we're all waiting for in terms of finding more of these things. It operates on the same kind of principle as PanStars. So what PanStars does is it scans the whole sky on a regular basis. You know, so you get a new picture of the same part of the sky every few days. And the Vera Rubin Observatory will do the same thing, but it's much, much bigger. And so is much more sensitive and can see much fainter objects. So whereas with PanStars, we only just saw a Muamu when it was at its closest to, just past its closest to Earth. With the Vera Rubin Observatory, we should be able to see those kind of objects when they're much further away, which should also mean we see them more frequently because they don't need to come so close. Let's hope they don't get too close before we see them. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So finally, just talking about the future, I'll let either of you or both of you answer this. Um, where is, you know, Oumuamua can no longer be seen, but what do we know about where it's headed? Is it headed for another... Uh, encounter in the distant future with another solar system or where'd it go? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, we've been more concentrated on trying to figure out where it came from and we tried to estimate uh, the damage that it might have received uh, traveling through the interstellar medium and uh, this is a little speculative but it would be a little bit more consistent with the data to have it traveling for about half a billion years. And at the rate it was going and the direction it was coming from, it probably originated in a very young solar system in the next spiral arm over in the galaxy, the Perseus arm. So that's our speculation. Uh, and where going to, I don't know, it barely survived passage through our solar system this time. It lost 90% of its mass. Really? So uh, I, I think it hopes it doesn't encounter another so That's great. And uh, it's great talking with both of you. And thank you both so much for your time. Thanks thank for having us. Yeah. And I was Dr. Alan Jackson and Dr. Stephen Desch, uh, astronomers at Arizona State University. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we look forward to a special Yuri's Night, marking the 60th, 60th anniversary of the first human reaching space, as well as the 40th anniversary of the first flight of the space shuttle. We're delighted to talk with with three-time shuttle astronaut Dr. Katherine Sullivan. She helped launch the Hubble Space Telescope. She was the first American woman to walk in space. And she served as NOAA Administrator under President Obama. And last year she became the first woman to visit the deepest point in the Earth's ocean, Challenger Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of the show a day before the general public. Now, we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit 
thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.